that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Look at those words. We have, we have repeated those words so many times they've almost lost their punch. It is the end all in our advice to another person. When we have no idea what else to say, we say, well, God will work it all together for good. But what we're saying is revolutionary. It's one of the most awesome promises of God we have in the Word. Look with me at exactly what it says. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who, there's a condition in this verse, love Him and are called according to His purpose. Now listen to this. God is not obligated to show everything for good for those who shrug their shoulders, receive their salvation, and go off their own way. No obligation. He can if he wants to, but he's not obligated. But when someone enters into a love relationship with him, when someone really gives him their heart, he's obligated. By virtue of his own wonderful name, he said, you want to see me play favorites? I never love anyone, he says, more than I love the next one to him. We are all the apple of his eye, but he can respond to us in different ways by virtue of our heart for him. And he says, if you love me and your attention is on me, those that don't love him, their attention's not on him enough to see if things are going to work out, amen? They're trying to work things out themselves. But he said, if you love me, you're looking for the way this is going to work out. And I'm going to tell you, I am obligated to you. And if you love me and you have resigned your life to my purpose, that's the other condition, who love me and are called according to my purpose, that you have resigned your life, you have committed your life to my purpose for you, I'm obligated to you to make everything in your life, even your failures, even the deepest pits, everything you've ever been through, I am obligated to make that poem rhyme. And some way, somehow, when it's written, it's going to make sense. It's going to make sense. That's his gift to those who love him and surrender their lives to his perfect purpose. I want to tell you, we go through things that we just do not understand. Strangely, this last year of my life has been not a mountain nor a valley, but a mountain and a valley at exactly the same time. We talk about having a mountain experience, and then we talk about having an experience down in the valley, but I have discovered you can have them both at exactly the same time. Amen? Because I have discovered that through one of the worst experiences of my life, he has drawn me to the Mount of Transfiguration. Done things in my life that were absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. And revealed himself in an entirely new way to me. When we took our precious son into our lives, when he was four years old, it never occurred to us for one moment that we would ever lose him. In fact, I told my husband before Michael ever came that if he had any thought that that child would ever go, not to let him come inside that home. Because I can tell you this, I cannot lose him. If you're going to bring him in, I want him for keeps. If you don't think he's here for keeps, then don't even bring him here. We believed when that child walked through that front door that it was forever. And I want to tell you something, ladies. It wasn't because God told us that either. He never said it one single time. It's because I wrote the outline of how I could deal with that situation. And when he said job description, you will be a mother to him, I said, okay, and it will be forever. I wrote my part of the job description. And that child came in our home. 
And the one reason I am so glad that I never had any clue that he would ever leave is because I did not love him like an aunt. I did not love him like a neighbor. I loved him like a mother, totally without restraint because I had no idea I would ever lose him. I loved him like I'd have him forever. And God knew. God knew that that's the kind of love he needed. If I had known I was going to lose him, I would have held back on my heart. So would you. That's just the human in us. Someone was just coming in for a certain length of time, I can promise you, I wouldn't have gotten all the way in. But I thought it was forever. And I sold out. And I'm telling you, for seven solid years, I never had anything going through my head that he wasn't back behind. You talk about one of the biggest focuses in our home. He got so much energy and so much attention because he was so very, very fragile. I'm so thankful to say that after the first couple of years that were the hardest years we had ever gone through to date at that time. Sometimes we're so glad we have no idea what we're getting into. Amen? Because why in the world would we sign up for it? But we had three or four years in there that were difficult. I'm here to tell you that by the end of the day, because he had such extreme attention deficit and many other uh, learning disabilities that made the day such a challenge from the moment we got up, so the moment he went to bed, I literally stood outside of his shower in the mornings and I would say, now wash your hair, now rinse your hair, now take the soap, wash your face. And we went through every step of every day exactly like that. We put on our socks together. We put on our shoes together because we had to do everything one step at a time. So you can imagine by the end of the day, when he got into bed, I walked downstairs looking at Keith like this, going, save me, save me. And I had figured at that particular time that when Michael was finally raised, I would have to check into some kind of center and rest up for about seven years, but that we were going to make it. And then God began to move in very, very strange ways. There are so many things I do not feel freedom to share because I want God to have the freedom to heal this precious heart without any kind of labels without anything being told that when he is a grown man and that one day perhaps he can testify of the glory of God that he will not be ashamed of. But I will tell you that we started seeing things that we knew were not normal things. And we ran with everything we had to every counselor. It would do no good for people to write me letters and give us good advice and tell us about this doctor and that doctor. We have spent everything we had. We have gone to every doctor you can imagine. We've been to the best of godly counselors. We went to the very best school in the state of Texas. We've done everything we know to do. Put him through lots and lots of testing. And we were finally told that something needed to give in that life. And it was way in there, deep in that heart, a broken place that we could not fix. I said, you cannot fix this one. I'll never forget it. Look at me straight in the eye. Mrs. Moore, you may have been able to fix a lot of things. You strike me as a strong woman, but you cannot fix this. You can't fix this one. They gave us some options of this and that, all things we hated. And I want to tell you that out of nowhere, and you listen to my heart, his birth mother popped up and said, I want my boy. She said, I'm trying to get my life together for the first time in my life. And you've done what I asked you to do. And now I want him back. It's a very complicated situation because she's a close relative. A close relative. How do you say, uh-uh, we have another plan? There were some things that were not tied up at the very end of that adoption process because of the birth father. And at that time, I thought, well, Satan is at work here. And now I know that God was leaving an opening. Because you see, God is about healing. And he wasn't only looking after Michael's life. He was looking after a young woman's life. 
who was trying to get herself together for the first time and was not doing a good job. We relinquished that child after seven years of complete focus to that mother, not because we thought she was a grand and glorious mom, not because we thought she deserved him. I'm not getting any of that across. I'm hoping not to. But because we prayed with all our hearts that she holds some kind of a key to that heart we do not hold. That somehow a sense of belonging. Now you ask me, would he come back with me tomorrow? Yes, I am the only mother he re ever remembers really ever having. But right now Agape says, I am not in his best interest. For some reason, this woman that gave birth to him needs to settle business with him. I don't know what the future is. I don't know what will happen now. I don't know if he'll be there forever. I don't have a clue what's coming now. I just know that God somehow strangely, painfully, is doing his will. I don't understand why this is his will. He did not get my vote on this one. But I am certain that it is. As I cried out for a word on Michael, all he would say to me is, for six years you have worked, and on the seventh you will rest. But I wasn't ready to rest. You will rest. I have never been through physical pain like this in my life. Never. I felt like I had the sharpest fillet knife you could imagine straight through the center of my heart. But God got through to me and said, the goal here is not that you be absent of pain. That pain is proof that I did the one thing you asked me. Beth, what did you ask me? Over and over, for seven solid years, what did you ask of me? That I would love him like a mother. Then every time you hurt, you remember, I did exactly what you asked. And not only that, you did what I asked you. I want to read you some words that I wrote Here recently, some of you are in this place where life is not going like you planned. Amen? These were some words that came to me at a time of great emotion, you can imagine. Has someone seen the life I planned? It seems it's been misplaced. I've looked in every corner. It's lost without a trace. I found one I don't recognize, things missing that were dear, promises I'd hoped to keep, and dreams I dreamed are here. Faces I had planned to see, hands I planned to hold, now absent in the pictures, not the way I told. Has someone seen the life I planned? Did it get thrown away? God took my hand from searching. Then I heard him say, Child, your ears have never heard, your eyes have never seen. Eternal plans I have for you are more than you could dream. You long to walk by faith, but I'm teaching eyes to see. I know what I am doing. Till then, you must believe. He's done so much, I felt ashamed to know he'd heard my moans, to think I'd trade in all he's done for plans made on my own. I wept over his faithfulness and how he'd proved himself, how he'd gone beyond my dreams and said to him myself, no, my ears have never heard, my eyes have never seen. Eternal plans you have for me are more than I could dream. Yes, I long to walk by sight, but you're teaching eyes to see. You know what you are doing. Till then I must believe. I felt his great compassion, mercy unrestrained. He let me mourn my losses and showed to me my gains. I offered him my future and released to him my past. I traded in my dreams for a plan he said would last. I get no glimpse ahead, no certainties at all, except the presence of the one who will not let me fall. 
Are you also searching for a life you planned yourself? Have you looked in every corner? Have you checked on every shelf? Child, your ears have never heard, your eyes have never seen. Eternal plans he has for you are more than you could dream. Perhaps you long to walk by faith as he's teaching eyes to see. He knows what he is doing. Child, step out and believe. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. More than your ears have heard, more than your eyes have seen, more than anything you could imagine. Glory is at stake here. He is the poet, and you are the poem. Bringing those lines 